In this objective, we're going to be looking at energy and changing states. Okay, so the subjective states that we should be able to explain changes in the heat Q absorbed or released by a system undergoing a phase transition based on the amount of substance in moles and the molar enthalpy of the phase transition. So during a phase change, temperature does not change. So we can really honestly see that in a lot of the graphs. But just note that we have to be told that this was a physical change over one species for this to be applied to phase changes occurring. So we can see based off the graph to the right, there are two spots where temperature does not change. It's going to be the plateaus, okay, uh, those horizontal lines. So you can see when we go from B to C and D to E, temperature does not change looking at that axis because this axis right here is temperature and this is time. So B to C, D to E phase changes, while A to B, C to D, and E to F are temperature changes like we learned previously in 6.3, okay? Q equals MC delta T. So energy being added, removed from the system is associated with the breaking or forming of intermolecular forces which makes sense because in unit three, we talked about intermolecular forces are gonna be associated with a lot of our phase changes, okay? So as mentioned just, uh, just a little bit ago, uh, here Q equals MC delta T cannot be used to determine heat transfer, okay? So our equation actually will change to Q equals M delta H. And that is because we, we, we aren't going to have a delta T because there's no Celsius, there's no change in temperature, there isn't a final and an initial. And then we're not going to have C because C is going to be the specific heat capacity in joules per gram Celsius. So here we're going to need a, we're gonna need something that isn't C, but similar to C, it's a constant. Here delta H ends up being our constant for our equation, Q equals M delta H, for phase changes. So let's talk about what delta H is. So we actually have two delta H's when it comes to phase changes. And again, delta H, think of it as a change in energy when we're talking about, in this case, a change in actual phases. So here we have something called enthalpy of fusion, and we have one called enthalpy of vaporization. These all involve the changing of states of matter. So when it comes to enthalpy of fusion, it's gonna be associated with melting and freezing. So when it comes to these phase changes, so its symbol is delta H subscript FUS for fusion. So if our value for delta H of fusion, if it's positive, that means that we're going from a solid to liquid, okay? We are absorbing energy to break those intermolecular forces to go from a solid to liquid. And if it's negative, that means we're going from a liquid to solid. So that's going to be releasing energy, liquid to solid. Please note solid to liquid goes with melting, liquid, solid to liquid to melting, freezing is liquid to solid, okay? Um, please note for enthalpy of fusion, it will have the units joules per gram, so as vaporization, but we also will be working with molar enthalpy, which if you think about molar, how we can change joules per gram is to joules per mole, and that would just be using molar mass for that, okay? Going with vaporization, hopefully you're thinking fusion was using stuff close together like a solid, vaporization, think vapor like a gas. So this is associated with boiling and condensing. It will have the denotion, the uh, delta H VAP vaporization. So if the value is positive for vaporization, it will be going from a li liquid to gas. And if it's negative, we're going gas to liquid. And so boiling is associated with liquid to gas while condensing is the opposite, gas to liquid. Please note that these are going to be constants, okay? These are constants 
for every single species that goes through any of these phase changes, you can find these values online. These are constants, just like our C values, our specific heat capacities were constants as well. Now I will say, Oh, there are some chemical species that don't have actual values found online because it's very hard for some of these phase changes to happen. For example, a lot of our ionic solids, they have such high melting points, which means they have even higher boiling points. So you sometimes might not have a delta H of vaporization for a lot of our ionic compounds, okay? So what's gonna happen is, I want us to look at this example right here, but it can be a little confusing, so make sure you're paying attention. So we're going to reference the graph from the beginning of our notes, and we're gonna calculate that heating curve, all right? So I'm gonna give us um, a scenario, and we're gonna calculate it. Now below, and I have a line to denote what I'm talking about, but here are the water constants below. So all of this right here are gonna be uh, the constants for water, Sorry, that's horrible. Here we go. These are the constants for water. If you found these online, that is all of the water's constants. So it, as a solid, as a liquid, as a gas, it has all different heat capacities. I then have the delta H of fusion for water and the delta H of vaporization, uh, which is 2260. Uh, again, these are all constants found online. So based off the graph above, which I'll go in just a second, if you look at this portion below the constants, we're gonna be calculating every single portion on the graph based off a scenario, okay? So I'm gonna come up to the top right here. Let's look at this graph. So here, <clears throat> this is gonna be water's heating curve, okay? Here, I'm gonna just label it based off uh, states of matter. So I know from A to B, this is solid. B to C, solid to liquid. C to D, liquid. D to E, liquid to gas. E to F, gas. So here, you essentially are going to have five Q's that you would need to solve for. Q1, Q3, and Q5 all will use Q equals MC delta T, while Q2 and Q4, sorry, will use Q equals M delta H. That's because uh, one, three, and five are temperature changes, while two and four are phase changes. Knowing the states of matter is very, very important as well. So let's come up with our scenario. So let's say we're working with two grams of water and it's going from negative 27 degrees Celsius to 150 degrees Celsius, okay? So looking at this curve, a lot of students are don't realize that you have to do every single curve, but if you look at this, if this is my initial, 27, and my final would be all the way up here, 150, you have to take into consideration the phase changes. Okay, so knowing that water melts and freezes at zero and that it boils and condenses at 100 is very, very important. So here, zero, and then here's 100. So taking this into consideration when we're going through all of this is very important. Also, this is an endothermic graph because of a heating curve. It's absorbing energy to break those intermolecular forces. All of our Q values need to be positive. But yes, after the after we solve for every single Q, we will take the total of all the Qs that we collected to get our overall Q for this reaction, okay? All right, so let's start this off. We're going from A to B, okay? So if you look at here, we're looking at Q1. So we're looking at this spot right here, okay? So here we're working with water as a solid. It's initially at negative 27 and it goes to zero degrees Celsius. So this is a temperature change, MC delta T. We said that this is a solid. So here, two grams of our water. Also, we're gonna have two grams for, our mass will be two grams for every single portion of the graph. So two grams, solid 
uh, water is 2.02 .02 joules per gram Celsius. And T final minus, minus initial, we had zero minus negative 27, which ends up being positive 27. You get your Q value as 109.08 joules. And this is our Q1, all right? All right, now let's move on to Q2. So I'm going to go back to the graph. We're going to be looking at this portion right here. So here we're going to be using Q equals M delta H. This is for a solid to liquid. So we need to make sure that we use the delta H effusion, which for water, it will be 334, which is right here. So Q2 is M delta H fusion. Q2 is two grams multiplied by positive 334 joules per gram. If we were actually going opposite and this was gonna be a cooling curve, exothermic, we would need to manually put a negative 334, okay? All right, Q2, you get 668 joules for the Q2 portion of the graph. Moving on, C to D. So here we're looking at this portion right here. So Q3, this is water in its, uh, nor its normal form, which is a liquid, and it's going from zero to 100. So here, water will be 4.18 based off the C liquid right here. So Q3 is MC liquid. Delta T, we have two grams multiplied by 4.18 joules per gram Celsius, and final will be 100 minus zero. You should get your Q3 as 836 joules. Moving on, now let's do D to E. So this is going to be this portion right here. This will be a phase change, so this will be associated with the delta H of vaporization. Here, delta H vaporization is 2,260. So here, Q4, we'll do two grams multiplied by positive 2,260 joules per gram. Here you get Q4 as 4,520 joules. So you can see when we go, the difference between uh, going from a fusion as well as vaporization, vaporization is always going to cause, uh, it's going to require a lot more energy compared to fusion just because once you go from liquid to gas, you have broken all final intermolecular forces. So it should require a lot more energy. And then lastly, Q5. So this will be this portion of the graph right here. This will be water, uh, water vapor, and it's going from initially 100 to 150. So we had to make sure we use the heat capacity of water as a gas, 2.06. So here, 150 minus 100. I definitely didn't leave myself enough room. Q5 is 206 joules. So this is a long problem, but after taking all the total Qs, you should get 6,339.08 joules as your final answer. Now, Again, this does require a lot of energy to make this happen. Obviously, if we had more than two grams, it's gonna require a lot more energy. Um, but again, this is a, a way to solve a heating curve or a cooling curve. You would just do the same process, just with all negative numbers. All right, so I have example two and example three, and I'm gonna actually have you try to solve these out yourself. I do wanna note, as mentioned previously, when we use Q, equals M delta H, we need to manually put a positive or negative for our delta H, sorry, delta H value, okay? So why don't you try these problems yourself and pause the video? All right, let's go over these problems. Okay, so 
In example two, I noticed that it had some key words that kind of told me and hinted that this was going to be an exothermic reaction. They said the word cooled. They also said released. Okay. So with this one, you know, when we look at 461.4 kilojoules per gram for fusion, it's a positive value if going up solid to liquid. If it's going backwards liquid to solid, we have to use a negative 461. So here I'm going to have to put a manually, manually put negative 461.4, multiply by the 100 grams, I end up getting negative 46,140 kilojoules for the amount of energy released. Also, if you really wanted to, you could have written that as 46,140 kilojoules released while keeping that value positive, okay? Uh, in Q2, this one is very interesting compared to the ones that we've been working working with because they have everything in the molar uh, molar enthalpy of fusion rather than just our normal joules per gram or kilojoules per gram, okay? So here I actually modified the equations to keep them as N instead of M. It's totally okay if you wanted to convert those moles to grams if you really wanted to, that's totally fine. Just know that your heat capacity, your specific heat capacity, as well as your delta H effusion had kilojoules per mole. So you needed to take that into consideration as well. Just for time's sake, I end up just leaving it. So here, look at my graph on the left. I realized that we did have to heat it to 933 where it was able to melt. Okay, this was a two step reaction, knowing uh, solving for Q1 and solving for Q2. After solving for them, I added them to get together to get 29.23 kilojoules. And then from there, I converted kilojoules to joules just because that's what the question was wanting how much energy in joules. Using uh, three sig figs, I got 29,200 joules for this problem. Overall, drawing pictures sometimes will help you figure out how many steps there are. If there's a temperature change, if it's a phase change, just you gotta be wary about um, the states of matter for these types of problems.